really strange experience with this. They were using it as a trigger object for one of their investigations. Uh, so they were experiencing it. It was, it was really saying nasty EVPs that had to do with uh, women. Um, people were feeling really compelled to open the box. They were feeling violent and not like themselves. Um, you know, one of the scarier things was they were doing spirit box sessions with it, and it seemed to know things about people in the room that no one should have known. Really scary stuff. And after they were done with this uh, investigation, they got a hold of us and said, hey, listen, uh, this guy thinks he's, he's, his relationship with this box is too extreme. I think what we're going to do is try and get him to give this thing to you. I didn't anticipate that would ever happen. Uh, when we are dealing with haunted objects and people who have haunted objects, we normally see one of two things. They are either so ready to get rid of these things that they would pay you to take them, or they would never ever get rid of them under any circumstance. And considering this guy's relationship with the box, we figured, well, we're never going to get this thing. Uh, and then we did an event at uh, the, the, the Mount Washington in New Hampshire, and this guy's there, and he has this big case with him. He walks up to us and he says, I think you guys need to have this. Uh, this is unhealthy for me. I want you guys to take it, and I want you to find out whatever you can about this box. And uh, we said, okay, you know, are you sure? Because you know, if we take this thing, you're probably not gonna get it back. We might have to get rid of it, or, or put it where it needs to be, or just keep it safe. And he's like, nope, take it. I can't have it anymore. So we took it home, and we start to do some investigating with it. We notice ourselves, our personalities start to change around this thing. We have horrible moods around it. We fight a lot. Dana and I don't really fight much, and we were fighting a lot around it. Uh, the EVPs that we were getting from it were just terrible, and we knew that there was something nasty about this thing. Yeah, so at this point, we're able to validate the experiences that the people who had been around it previously were having, because again, we we're at the same time having our own experiences. So there's something happening around this box, and we have to try to figure out why. So after we had the box for a few months, uh, we got a call from Nick Groff, and he was doing an episode of Paranormal Lockdown in a mansion that no one had been in for a long time, and he said, hey, why don't you guys bring some of your objects and see if we can use them to kickstart the activity in this place in case it's a dud? And I said, well, that's a great idea. So we grabbed a bunch of our most popular and, and most active objects and we, we took them out. And then as we were leaving, I said, you know what? This is an opportunity to play with a lot of high-tech equipment that we can't afford. So let's take the Dimmick box and see what happens. So we took the Dimmick box. It's on an episode of Paranormal Lockdown. You could look it up and see it. They actually ended up making it more of a focal point than we had expected them to. And uh, it, actually, it actually worked. Like the minute that the box was brought out of the Pelican case, weird stuff started popping off. So after this, we get a, a phone call from this guy. After this episode is on national television and millions of people have seen the Dybbuk box and he says, I want it back. And I said, okay, we've never really encountered this before. What do we do about this? And I said, okay, tell you what, we had some inklings about the box. And I said, we're not finished investigating it yet, but we're set to do another episode of this web series We'll give it back to you on camera and we'll give you our findings from it. And he said, that's fine. So we only had a few weeks to work. And the first thing we wanted to do was find out, all right, what's inside of this thing really? Well, we didn't want to open it because we wanted to be safe. So we cheated a little bit and we got a hold of some friends of ours who are CAT scan technicians and literally snuck it into a hospital like a Scooby-Doo episode. It was ridiculous. We were literally like looking for any sort of tall surface that we could hide behind from the doctors. So we were just like like a potted plant. We were all just hiding behind it. By the way, this is how we spent our anniversary. It is. We spent our anniversary giving a Dybbuk box a cat scan. That's how weird we are. We sat in the parking lot on a Saturday afternoon with our friend who was the technician in front of us, and uh, we've got this Dybbuk box, and he turns around and he says, okay, that's the doctor leaving right now. We need to get in there real quick. If we run into anybody, the story is, the box belonged to your grandmother and you don't want to break the lock because you don't know if it's valuable or what's inside. I'm like, okay, fine. Didn't encounter anybody. We actually got in nice and smooth, and we got this scan. What you're seeing there is some sort of a cup, and then this thing around the edge is some, uh, looks like a velvet bag, and uh, there's a tie on the end of it. So immediately we realize, wow, there's not the stuff that's supposed to be in a divot box in this thing. 
uh, we said, uh, hey, can we get a better look at that? And sure enough, they can do a 3D image of it. So there's some weird little plug on the bottom, but what this is, is this is a votive candle. Uh, you can see even the wax plug with the metal on the bottom, which helps us date this thing, because these things didn't exist, supposedly, when this original Dybbuk box was created. Uh, that plug on the bottom is uh, like some putty or something with a nail driven through it. We were able to take the box out and look at it and see that the nail had been driven through and cut off on the end at the bottom to keep this thing from rattling around while it's inside. Now, the box was dipped in wax, so it had a lot of traditional things that you would see on these Dybbuk boxes, but it didn't have what it was supposed to inside. What we ended up doing was uh, taking this thing and we started asking around and seeing what some of our friends who are experts at stuff we're not experts in had to say about it. And we started to notice there was a really interesting thing about Jewish mythology, and that is the fact that there is no such thing as a Dybbuk box in it. Dybbuk's existed. But Dybbuk's were never demons. Dybbuk's were actually human spirits that were just upset about something. So they would attach to a person and they would hang out until they had whatever goal they needed achieved in life completed in death. Kind of how we see ghosts today. An interesting thing happened. This guy here, his name is Kevin Manis. He ended up reaching out to us after seeing the initial episode about this box and saying, hey, uh, I'm actually the guy who put the original eBay post up back in like 2002 and 2004. And this is what he had to say to us. Entirely false and erroneous on the claim that the box being used had a so-called fifth level demon was a bunch of hogwash. I'm uniquely qualified to make these claims as I'm the original creator of the story of the Dybbuk box, which appeared as one of my eBay posts back in 2003. The idea that Dybbuk boxes have some kind of history prior to my story, and the idea that a Dybbuk box could contain anything other than a Dybbuk, along with any deviation to the type of context Contents I created to be found inside a Dybbuk box is laughable at best. How about this? If you or anyone else can find any reference to a Dybbuk box anywhere in history prior to my eBay post, I will pay you $100,000 and tattoo your name on my forehead. It is a bet that he would win because it doesn't exist. The implications of this are there is no such thing as a Dybbuk box. They don't exist. None of them. No matter where they exist, on eBay, in museums, they're not real. Another interesting tidbit about Kevin Manis is he, on top of the fact that he was a horror writer, he was also a woodworker. Yeah, put two and two together yeah. there, and you have a wonderful viral story, one of the earliest viral horror stories on eBay. This is a, an old etching of what a Dybbuk actually looked like, a human spirit attached to a man uh, basically weighing him down until his incompleted work is completed. So we had a really awkward thing coming up where we had to tell this guy, listen, uh, not only do you not have a Dybbuk box, but Dybbuk boxes are not real. And there was still this lingering question as to, if these things were not real, why were we still experiencing paranormal activity with them? We had a few ideas about that. And we presented these ideas to him on camera in this extremely awkward interview. <laughs> Uh, this show takes about a year from shooting it to actually putting it out. So, you know, we thought this story was done. It's over. We told this guy, Dybbuk boxes aren't real. Please stop calling it a demon and scaring people with it. It's not funny. And eventually someone might get actually really frightened and hurt themselves. Uh, one of the things that we have always believed with, with, you know, the work that we do, we've investigated a lot of haunted houses. And the first thing we do is we look at the people who are in the house and we look at their emotional states. And one of the things that I strongly believe is if you can solve a, 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 a stressful problem in a family unit, you can make a haunting go away. You can, you can just kill a haunting, right? One of the things that we did with this Dybbuk box was uh, towards the end when we realized what it was, we actually sat it down in the office and I would put my garbage can on top of it and I would just throw trash into it all day long or I would do the most Ghostbusters 2 thing ever, and I'd pick it up and I would hug it and tell it I love it, and I would call it my Dibby Wibby Wibbick box. I didn't do any of that Dana stuff. did not do that. She thought it was silly. I did. But by the time we were done with it, like we couldn't get so much as an EM bleep from it, like an EMF meter wouldn't even light up around it. So we basically killed it. I'm sure this guy was very happy about that. Uh, so a year goes by, we're getting ready to uh, present 
uh, this episode. Uh, it was going to come out in like two or three weeks. And <laughs> I'm in the living room reading my morning news, and uh, I hear this storm start coming from the other side of our house. I'm not going to repeat what Dana was saying, because there's children in the room, but Dana was very upset, and she runs into the room, and she shoves a, a uh, phone in my face and says, what the heck is this? And what we saw was an eBay listing for this Dybbuk box that said nothing about our findings. It says Dybbuk box with incredible paranormal findings and evidence. And there's a picture there of us with our friends. Uh, there's Grant Wilson there. There's uh, our friend John Tenney behind there. You can see down there, there's pictures of it actually having the CAT scan. And as you can see, this thing's already been bid up to $4,000. It's not real. And it was bid up to four grand. See, it certainly seemed to us like this guy was trying to unload it before everyone found out that what he had was not a real Dybbuk box. Uh, just so you can see again, $4,000. The most frustrating part about this eBay scam is that no one asked us. We're very easy to find. We have a bunch of websites where we're on all social media platforms. Only one person reached out to us before this to say, hey, I see that you guys are involved in this. It must be legit, right? And I said, no, it's not. In fact, you're the only person who's been on this to bother asking. Incredibly infuriating. Uh, it was a hard lesson to learn. But this right here is why you don't buy haunted objects on eBay, because it's just somebody out to scam you out of your money. On that note, Let's talk about the ethics. The Sal caring for salty portion of the yeah. This is the salty portion. If we believe truly that there is a such thing as a ghost, and we believe that ghosts can be attached to objects and places, we have a responsibility to treat them that way. We have a responsibility to treat them as an intelligence. So, taking these objects, selling them putting them in rings of salt. Or exploiting them. Or exploiting them. is It makes you a pretty crappy person. And so one of the things that we never want to do is we never want to deal with people who are selling so-called haunted objects. Uh, we don't put things in rings of salt. We don't jump to conclusions about something being a, a demon or even jumping to the conclusion that it's somebody's grandmother. There are weirder things, typically, that these things are. Uh, so the ethics of dealing with these things can, be, can get tricky, and it's a slippery slope when people want you to have something, to promote something, or you want to put something under glass. The reality, actually, of a lot of what we end up doing, especially when we're working with clients, is people bring us things that they have really traumatic energy associations with. And sometimes they bring us things that are from their past and they're parts of themselves that they don't want to really deal with anymore. And so part of we, what we have to do then is continue to kind of teach people about the ethics of why exploiting or making haunted objects silly is really a horrible thing and we should be really looking at the ethics of what it means to have something that you truly believe has an intelligence attached to. We, again, have a responsibility at that point to make sure that whatever's happening there is ethical and stays ethical. Uh, when we deal with hauntings, we usually classify them one of three ways. Uh, we classify them as residual, so we see a lot of that type of stuff in things that were part of some big traumatic event. So often like the Civil War, you'll get artifacts from the Civil War, they act up, maybe it's around a certain person, place, or time period, uh, but they don't really ever seem to interact with you. They don't seem to have any kind of intelligence. Then we have what we call an intelligent haunting, and that's something that ha it shows a degree of interaction of intelligence. It seems that you can uh, understand each other to a point. And then there's a third type, which we see more often than anything, and we never hear people talk about, and that's an intentional haunting. It's when people have loaded an object or a place with so much intention that they've effectively created a haunting themselves, and most of the time they don't realize that's what's happened. Uh, one of the things that we have in the museum, we have a box that's just called the Porcelain Clown Box. It's just creepy clowns that people have sent to us, and we've never experienced activity around it. We've never been able to document experience or activity around it, but the people who donated it to us have. And so again, that's like what Greg was just saying, this, the idea of associating something with an object can create the activity around it quite often. A really fantastic uh, example of a, an intentional haunting is a crybaby bridge. How many people have been to a crybaby bridge or know of one? 
whole bunch of you, and I bet most of you are from even different states. There's a legend of, cry, of a crybaby bridge in just about every single state. They're almost exactly the same with small variations, uh, but it's like, you know, there's a woman in white, you can hear the baby crying that she tossed off the edge or that, that was killed in a car accident on the bridge. Uh, the thing is, like, people can go to these places and they can hear the baby crying. They can take photos that look like a woman in a white dress. They experience this activity, even though the stories are always just folklore. There's no history behind them. They're just made up. But after 50, 60, 70 years of teenagers driving out there in the middle of the night, they actually start to manifest this stuff because they put so much intention into it. The Dybbuk box is an absolutely perfect representation of an intentional haunting. But frankly, I think all Dybbuk boxes are because none of them are real. I'm hammering that one home for a reason. Let's talk about eBay for a second. You guys want to buy the Spirit of Paul? He's eight inches. He's only thirteen dollars. It's a steal. Uh, as someone who deals with haunted objects, I can tell you they're incredibly rare. They're very hard to find. But this guy, for some reason, has like two dozen of them. I don't know where he's getting all these haunted objects, but he's got lots of them, and they are an absolute steal. This one's really great. Here's a Dybbuk box. This one says nine bids, and it's only thirty-two bucks. But uh, it's probably because it's already open, so there's a discount. This one I love. This is 100,000 Jinn. The Dragon Jinn of Babylon, Haunted Madrid Elder Genie Binding Talisman, also known as a frickin' marble. Someone will buy that, I promise you. I think the next one's my favorite, though. This one's great. How many people are familiar with the concept of incubi and succubi? Well, kids, close your ears, because these are ghosts that'll do it with you, if you can summon them correctly. But guess what? If you go to eBay for 50 bucks, you can get a ring that'll summon the Lycan Werewolf Man Lover. He's also bisexual, so you have your choice. Craig. And his name is Craig. Craig. Craig the werewolf. Craig the bisexual werewolf man lover. My favorite part about Craig, by the way, is a very good friend of mine is an adult male film star. He came to the first lecture we gave with this slide in it, had tears in his eyes when he came up to us later and said, I know Craig. I've worked with Craig. I keep telling him that we need to have Craig come to the, at least one museum exhibit and just sit on a bench shirtless with the ring on and just be like, it's really, guys, it worked. At least once that has to Well, our, our friend who is the, the film star said, listen, the next time you guys are in LA, just pop the 50 bucks, buy that ring. I'll introduce you to Craig. And then you can do a video, like stop motion, where you put the ring on and then Craig it's just like, appears. Ah! And you can go, see guys, it Let's works. do it. Anyway, the whole point of that is eBay is a scam. Don't buy haunted objects on eBay, it's a joke. Uh, and it's just kind of tacky. We're gonna talk about now the opposite of an intentional haunting. We're gonna talk about an intelligent haunting. Uh, this is a story of Billy. And we call him Billy because he's an idol. Womp womp, worst dad joke ever, I know. But the, uh, we used to call him the idol of nightmares. And as we got to know Billy, we really changed our opinion on it. And Billy has taught us a lot about what it's like to deal with, with a haunting in general. And this story really uh, summarizes our mission dealing with haunted artifacts and doing what we do with the museum. Uh, several years ago, we were on Coast to Coast AM, and they were, we were talking about the work that we do with the museum, and we got an email from a guy afterwards. We typically, every time we do a, a big radio interview, we get a ton of emails from people. And this guy was intriguing because he said, listen, I heard you guys on Coast to Coast. I have something that I think you guys will like. I would love for you to take it off my hands, but it's a bit big for me to send through the mail. Uh, if you will meet me halfway, I'll just hand it to you in person. You guys live in Cincinnati, I'm in Dayton, so it's not very far away. I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. And Dana said, absolutely not. We're not gonna meet some weirdo who heard us on late night AM radio. No way. 
I was not really looking forward to getting murdered. Dana's the smarter one of I the am. two of us, which is a, a so recurring theme in recurring. our stories. Yeah. Uh, so of course I took Dana's, uh, I took her feelings into account and I emailed the guy he back and I said, where do you want me to meet you? <laughs> and we met him in the scariest place imaginable. We met him in a Walmart parking lot between Dayton and Cincinnati in the middle of the afternoon. Publicly as we possibly could. <laughs> Dana actually sat in the car with 911 ready I to was go ready home. To go. And the story that this guy had told us about uh, this piece was that he had just moved into this house about six months earlier and he was running some new cable and he's uh, in the crawl space under the house and he finds this lump of dirt and under the dirt, it's a burlap sack bound in twine. And he takes this thing upstairs and he cuts it open and he finds this beautiful statue inside. And he says, well, that's weird. Why would that be downstairs? Uh, so he just you know, doesn't think much of it and he leaves it in his office and then goes about his day. That night, their child comes running into their room and says, mommy, daddy, the little man came in my room and he pulled the covers off of me while I was sleeping. And they said, well, you know, it's kind of a scary statue. It's a kid being a kid. Until stuff started to happen to them. They would hear someone running through the house at night. Drawers would open and close. Lights would turn on and off. Typical poltergeist type stuff. But everything was fine until they started having the nightmares. Now, he would not tell me any details about these nightmares. We meet this guy in, in this Walmart parking lot. Uh, Dana, you know, he looked totally normal. That's the other thing. This guy didn't look like a weirdo at all. Uh, he looked like Ted Danson with a baseball cap pulled down real tight. Like he didn't want people, maybe it was Ted Danson. I don't know. Uh, this uh, is a photograph. Yeah, uh, he hands it to me and he says, it's your problem now. And I said, no, it doesn't really work like that. You got to tell me some more details about this thing. And he kind of hems and haws, and I was like, well, let me start here. You wouldn't tell me what any of the nightmares were. I, it, it's important for me to know, because this stuff might come back around, and we'll learn something from it. So I need to know every detail. And he kind of sighed and said, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what my wife dreamed about. I'm uncomfortable repeating it. But I'll tell you this. I had a dream that was the realest dream I've ever had. I've never experienced anything like it before. I was just in bed with my wife. We were watching television. And I just real calmly leaned over onto the nightstand, picked up this big knife and stabbed her in the chest, cut her all the way down to her stomach, pulled her heart out, and I started to eat it. And he said, I could taste the blood, I could feel the blood, I could smell it. It was like, it was real. And I snapped out of it and immediately said, this thing has got to go. So if you wanna know what my face looked like after I heard this story, Dana was smart enough to actually have her phone open. It's a little bit like that. And then I, proceeded to make the exact same face back at him when he told me the story. <laughs> Thankfully it wasn't a photograph. I was a little bit excited though because I liked something that has had a lot of activity because the whole point is to try and figure this out and learn more about why this stuff happens. And one of the ways that we learn stuff the most is by, we have our museum, unfortunately we don't have it here today, but it's a traveling museum. So we travel from coast to coast all over the country. Uh, we're going to the UK for the first time this year. And we're taking these objects to people because there's not many places where people can experience this stuff. And a big part of why we like to do that is because we meet people who are smarter than us. That's really important in our work. So we meet people that are experts in everything from the type of wood that something is created out of. We've met anthropologists, folklorists, uh, anybody, anybody you can imagine. And that's how a lot of our biggest breaks come. So I was excited to take Billy to our first event, which was literally just days later, uh, and see what people thought about it. I like meeting psychics who give us impressions on things. Uh, I like meeting historians, art historians. Uh, so we get there, to the, we, we, we get this, uh, this object, and we go home, and I print up a little tag that says, you know, it's just question marks. I have no idea where this thing's from. And we're on our way up to Upper Michigan, and we get halfway, and our car breaks down. And we thought, well, you know, there's a lot of miles on our car. It's about time. So they call AAA, and they tow us. And we get to the shop, and the guy's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with the car. It starts right up. Check the spark plugs and everything. It doesn't work. It's fine. So I said, okay, it's, a, it's just a glitch, whatever. We went. We had a great time at the event. Uh, people had a lot of experiences with the idol. They were starting to have their own weird nightmares after handling the idol. Uh, and then we had another event two weeks later. Same thing happens. We break down. 
This time only about half an hour from our house. Get towed, same thing. Nothing's wrong with your car, man. Everything's okay. And I went, okay, what's the only thing that we've added to the collection since then? It's the statue. So we sit the statue down, and as weird as this might sound, we have a conversation. And we say, listen, we just want to help you. We don't know where you're from. We don't know what you need. But we are going to listen. You can share our space with us. But you need to work with us. And after that, we never had another problem with the car again. Except I started to have really terrible nightmares. And they featured this statue very prominently. Uh, they typically were all the same type of thing. I was in a place that had to do with travel. So uh, airports, uh, train stations, Greyhound stations. And I would get this feeling that somebody was staring at me. Everybody kind of knows that feeling. And I'd look around until I would see a little man about this tall, uh, jet black skin, bright blue eyes, and I always knew who it was because he was wearing a burlap shawl. And he was just staring at me. Never said anything. I just got this feeling that it was, all right, you see me and I see you. And that was the feeling I'd get and I'd wake up in a cold sweat because that's kind of a scary dream to have. And uh, I tried not to think much of it, but I would have this dream every single time I would hold the statue. Dana wouldn't even hold the statue for the longest time. But one of our mottos is curiosity over fear. You don't ever learn anything if you're too afraid to learn anything. So we continued to work with the statue. Uh, we would do EVP sessions with the statue, and it was nothing but screaming. I have an example of this. This is uh, from a public investigation we were hosting at uh, Missouri State Penitentiary. Um, every time we would get a vocalization on one of our recorders, it would always seem like something would go wrong. So people's electronics wouldn't work right in front of this thing. Uh, and it just kept happening. And there were people who were legitimately uncomfortable and thought, why are you talking to this thing? This thing's a demon. You're going to get us all possessed. Uh, but we kept pressing on. Because again, curiosity over fear. And eventually, there were words that started to pop up in these sessions. Uh, this one was one of my absolute favorite EVPs we captured with Billy. Uh, this was a group experiment. When we typically lead investigations, we like to get everybody in the room and do one big group experiment at the end. And this time, we wanted to do something stranger than normal. So we said, uh, our friend John Tenney, who's one of our fellow researchers, we said, what's something weird we can do? And he's like, I got it. Somebody yell out a word. Someone yelled out the word goat. And he said, perfect, it's just weird enough. Everybody look at Billy and just focus on the word goat. Mentally send that word to him. And let's see if we can get him to repeat it in an EVP. So a room, about as many people as you guys, all in a circle, Billy in the center, sent that word. And this is the response we got when we played the recorder back. Maybe a sense of humor. Uh, that's really interesting to us. Over time, Billy got less scary to people, and the nightmares stopped happening. In fact, people started to have good dreams with him in them. Uh, and then a really weird thing started to happen, where people started to bring Billy gifts. Uh, first, it started off as like cigars and, and uh, shots of alcohol, um, and it was everything up to like personal things. Like people bring him like you know twelve sided die and, and sometimes photographs. Uh, there was a woman at an event that brought him a missing poster of, uh, of a family member. And people started to bring him stuff and ask him for things, and they would start to experience luck when they were doing it. And we don't know really where this came from. It just sort of started. Uh, and we just kind of let it happen. Here's another one. Uh, we also noticed that if Billy was ever really quiet, and I, w I would just leave the room, and he would start to pipe up again. And this is the type of response we would get. So the question has always been, who or what is Billy? And why is there so much intelligence attached? Uh, one of the best things that happened to us was we met a, a, an archeologist at, from Chicago's Field Museum at an event in uh, Chicago. And the minute we found out he was there, we we're like, dude, come by our museum. We have so many things we need to ask you about. And one of the things that he zeroed in on was Billy. And he said, listen, you know, my expertise is Native American artifacts, but I can tell you he's probably pretty old. That looks like ivory. Um, and, and he's obviously from Africa. Let me ask one of my colleagues in Africa and see what he has to say. So he took a bunch of photos of him and then uh, sent him to his friend. And I thought, well, you know, we might never hear back. But just about a week later, we get an email that says, Billy's a small Bakongo uh, from the Congo in Central Africa, a figure made in the style of a kisi. 
a divine figure often used in healing and conflict resolution rituals. It has no nails and was probably made for personal use as protection against the evil eye. The design and symbolism of the inlays relate to protection against the evil eye. The inlays are usually made of bone, ivory, and shell. On our phone call, he told me this probably belonged to the healer for his personal use. This was huge, because once we had a name and a place, we could start doing accurate research. And we dug in and we started to find things that looked just like Billy. You know, that's one, that's a Kisi object. Uh, that one's in a collection in Paris. Uh, the other one there is from uh, uh, the National Museum of Ethnography. Um, so once we figured that out, we were able to learn a little bit more about Kisi figures. Uh, this is one of the earliest uh, uh, write-ups, anthropological write-ups, of what a Kisi figure actually is. The Congolese people from this part of the area uh, of Africa, they had no written history. All of their history was oral history. This was written down by Christian missionaries who came to the area. So they obviously had a much different impression about what these things were than the actual Bakongo people did. Uh, in fact, the people of the Congo, they believed that these items were how they communed with their ancestors, with how, how they communed with the spirits of the earth and the air, uh, they, how they communed with their gods that they worshiped. These were not seen as a scary thing. In fact, they were kept in the centers of towns. And the reason they would have nails in them is when people would either uh, get married or make a deal, uh, they would actually hammer nails into the statue together because it was a way of saying, we are making a pact with the gods right now. And if you go back on this, you're angering them. These were actually a really beautiful thing. And the sad part is when the missionaries came in, they took all of these statues and they burned them or they destroyed them or they took them and desecrated them and used them as art projects. They would take them home with them, which is probably how Billy ended up in a crawl space in Dayton, Ohio, and probably why well, he didn't like white people very much at first. In fact, we had a, an event in Mississippi not too long ago, and a guy came up to us and he said, I came here just to see Billy. And he said, do you mind if I make an offering to him? And I thought, well, what do you know that we don't? And I said, that's fine. Uh, and so he went out to his car and he got a little bottle of alcohol. He took his shoes off and he kneeled down in front of Billy and he poured a drink and then he pressed his head up against his and then put a book up to him and then got up and said thank you. And then he turned around as he was leaving and he said thanks to us and he said, by the way, the reason he was a little weird with you guys is because he's not used to hanging out with white folks. And I went, that makes sense. That makes sense. So. This is actually part of an oral history of how a Kisi figure is made, and this is a little more true to the fact. This tells the story of a man from a tribe who passes away and decides, I'm going to come back and I'm going to teach the tribe things that I've learned in the afterlife to benefit them. Much different story. It's actually a really beautiful story. We would not have gotten to this point with Billy if we had not pushed past our initial fear. We would have done what a lot of people do with ghosts and haunted objects and haunted buildings. We would have put a ring of salt around it, thrown a glass case around it, told everyone it was a demon, and then let that be there. That's tantamount to torture for something that's intelligent. We didn't do that, and now there are people who are being positively affected by just being around Billy. We have a, a place in our living room that's just overflowing with things that people have sent him. There was a woman who came to us uh, she, we, we do the same event every year uh, up in Michigan. And she came to us the first year and she was too scared to get near Billy because, I mean, you know, it's intimidating. There's a lot of peer pressure that happens at our museum. There's a lot of people who say, I dare you to go hold that, I dare you to see that. And she didn't, she was too scared to hold him. Uh, and then the next year she came back and she said, you know what, your lecture changed my mind. I'd like to hold him and just see how I feel. So she picked him up and she put him down and she said, you know, that was fine. I didn't really feel anything weird, that was great. That night, she had a dream in which her mother was in a field, a wheat field, and she said her mother came near her and said, you know, it's time to let it go. She said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then she said, well, he does. And behind her was this tall African man, and he looked a lot like Billy, and he said, it's on your windowsill in the kitchen. And she woke up and her father's wedding ring 
was on the windowsill in the kitchen, and she had never been able to let his, his death go. And she came to the event the next day with that wedding ring and put it around Billy's neck and said thank you. And that's where it stayed. And that's the type of story that we experience with him all the time because we pushed past that fear through curiosity. Don't put things on a glass case. Don't put a ring of salt around them. Don't be afraid of things uh, without learning more about them. Obviously, there's a level of caution that everyone should exercise when we're dealing with things that, that have to do with the unknown. But if we are too afraid to understand something, then we're never going to learn anything about it. Uh, and that can go for our neighbor. You know, if you take anything away from the talk that we've given you today, I hope that it's that you will be a little more curious about things that you don't understand. Not be so scared. Don't do, you know, anyone that wants you to be afraid of the unexplained has something to gain. They either want to be the only person who can solve that problem for you. They want to be a person who can sell you a scary book or a movie, which are fun. Those are great. We like being scary. It's awesome. But they're trying to get something from you by making you afraid. Don't be afraid. Be curious. Explore. That's the whole point. And when you do, you will get to experience the most amazing things in the world. Things like this. Or even just getting to know a neighbor that maybe you didn't, you didn't work up the courage to talk to. Uh, if you want to support our mission, you want to know more about us, we do have a membership program. We'll tell you all about it. There's probably a few museum members in the room right now. Yeah, there's a few of you, and they can tell you about it too. Or come to our, our booth out in uh, uh, Tent 1, and uh, we'll tell you about Hellier. We'll talk about goblins. We'll talk about haunted objects. Thank you guys for showing up. You've been an Thank awesome crowd. Really appreciate it. Have fun with the rest of the festival.